evening, everyone. Mike. <laughs> I've been trying to remember people's names. And I, every time I get it correct, I think I'm a genius. <laughs> so, um, and I'm remembering a long time ago, Roshi Jones said, you know, just passing, it wasn't good or bad. You always bring a pile of books. You know, when I give a talk, and sure enough, and then on my way out, I thought I would bring you this, too, to show you. My one-year diary. Do you remember this? This was actually um, not mine. I, uh, how do I even talk about this? Um, I've had a really hard time this summer, and I did a lot of crying, which was good. And I'm telling you that because we think in Zen we can't do any of that, but really you can do everything. So during the crying, many things come up, and I really gave myself space for it. This was um, one person that was very important to me that was dying, and then suddenly other people I remembered were dying and or died and. So a lot happened, and I really wanted to give space to it. And I did, and I have, and I will. But um, one of the people was my high school friend, Phyllis DiGiovanni. And um, I haven't seen her since I was 20. She was my best friend. We went totally different directions but we were very close and she was very smart and she was wonderful. And uh, I think my life was so busy. I was so dedicated to bringing the Dharma writing practice as pure Zen. I don't know anything else. One of my students recently had the nerve to say to me, after 21 years of studying with me, He's from Wichita, Kansas, and he said, you've been teaching Zen? I said, Link, I said, Lincoln, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> That's all I've been teaching. He said, yeah, we've been in silence. So we, you know, but I realized if you're not in the world of Zen, you don't know what it is. So if I mention it and we keep writing, let her, let her talk. She's just, who knows what she's talking about. I have that when I read a book. Sometimes I skip something that I don't know what they're talking about. So um, Phyllis, you know, and I'm almost ashamed to say this. I remember being at a restaurant in Taos, very busy teaching at Mabel Dodge, and a waiter who had worked with Phyllis on the East Coast, and we were the same age, and she was 61 or 62, and he said she just died. And I remember thinking, oh, well, thank you. It's amazing you know that I know Phyllis. But that was it, because I was so busy helping the world. So during these last months, I sobbed about Phyllis. And I asked her to please forgive me. And coincidentally, her daughter wrote me. And her daughter is um, just got an MA at Lesley College in Massachusetts in Dharma. Uh -huh. Do you, I don't know if you know about it, but it's wonderful. And so we really could talk. And I said, well, do you want to come out here? She said, in a minute. And she flew out. And so this weekend, she was here for two nights. And she brought me Phyllis's diary. And, um, you know, we couldn't stop talking. And um, I just want to tell you that I was reading it. It's a very young girl's diary. But Mrs. Hamburger was one of her teachers. And I remember that name. Yeah, Mrs. Hamburger. <laughs> and. Um, so why am I bringing, oh, I'm bringing this up because we came from the same hard scrabble life. And Meredith reminded me 
Phyllis's father was a garbage man, drove a gar garbage truck. She'd never been to a restaurant and she'd never been on a plane till she got married. And I heard about her whole life. And um, there's no judgment. I just feel like, and I don't feel like, oh, I made it out. And she didn't. We both had our lives. But now I've been questioning my life a lot. Like, wait a minute. How did I get into Zen? And think that I am supposed to bring writing practice to everyone. And how did I put that together with Katagiri? And what did you understand? Do you understand? I'm questioning everything. Why didn't, I don't know what I else, I, well, what did you want to do, Natalie? Well, the only thing I remember is I wanted to be a dentist. <laughs> I thought it was a good idea, but um, I went in a different direction. So um, I decided tonight that I would, I'm going to make you work a little, even though you might not know it. Um, I'll start. I don't have to, I don't need these for a minute. So I'm going to give you the mind of writing. And it's the, I, I don't, almost don't want to use the word Zen anymore because I'm aware how much outside this wonderful universe, it's a little bit stinky and a little bit like, or they've read every book on it. Because in the old days, there were no books on it. But you can read a book on it and think, oh, I got Zen. What's next? Um, so I'm going to give you, so I need you to pay attention. Um, and I say, I'm going to give you the mind of Zen. That means not my mind, even though I'll probably use specific details from my life. And you all have the specific details of your life, but the mind and the mind, I don't mean the brain. The mind for me is all of this. You know, my breath, my knees, my little toes, my elbows, everything. Oh, and really, if you keep doing writing practice, it really goes outside you. Okay, so the mind of writing is all of you, but how do I communicate it with specificity? And we don't want to hear specificity, the truth. You just want to hear the nitty gritty details. And you have no other details, but your own life. Okay, so we're going to start. and. One of the things that I understood in, um, yeah, how did you get into this, Natalie? You were very young, 26. And I would sit a lot. We sat a lot. That's all we did. And there were no books at the time. There were just no books about it. And I wish there weren't any now, because that means you would have to just practice and shut up and not think you know anything. So in all the years, I watched mostly Katagiri Roshi because he was my teacher twice a week. And um, it's Wednesday night like this and Saturday morning. He gave Dharma talks and he spoke very broken English. And I would study his mind. I didn't know what he was talking about mostly. But what I watched... And this was in his mind. He would start over here. Now, this might not always be true, but I watched it. He starts over here. And I think, where is he going? And, you know, it seemed like, and at least sometimes two hours. And we had to sit like this. You didn't move. And you'd listen. I'm like, please, God, tell him to stop. <laughs> And we were all just aching, you know, aching, you know, even though I was young, 
my body hurt, my knees, everything, sitting room. And it goes on and on. And I was sitting on the Zafo and the Zafton. And you don't move. But what I watched was, and I knew he was out there. You know, he was just going. What I watched, the one thing that I saw was that he began over here, in and in, and a lot about Dogen. Dogen, there was no translations. You know, um, Roshi Joan mentioned that um, Kaz Tanahashi really brought Dogen to the United States and to English speaking people. And he did. Um, you can read him now, if you understand him, it's a different story, but you could, but we didn't have any. So he, Dogen, he liked Dogen a lot. Dogen, Dogen, no, 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 no. And it was right back at the end of the talk. Now it wasn't, now what I watched was, it had its own, um, its own uh, structure, the mind, had its own structure, because at that point, Katagiri was out there. Do you understand? And then it came back. But he wasn't thinking, oh, now I have to come back. It came back. And so I watched that. And so um, it's almost, what is it? The mind is, um, I'm not getting the right word that I want. It's not, well, this isn't the word, but it's not flabby. If you get out of the way, it's really connected. But the problem is we're constantly yada, 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 discursive thinking, which I repeat over and over. And writing practice or hopefully sitting you go below that. But how do you go below that? You don't, okay, now I'm going to go below it. Bologna sandwich. What do I have to say about a bologna? No, you just relax. And eventually writing does writing. Sitting does sitting. I just remembered Katagiri used to say, especially during Sashin, None of you are sitting zazen. And I think, how does he know that? Well, he was right. We were all, you know. And it was probably obvious in the way we sat. Poor man. So I'm going to begin. So I jotted down some things. I'm not saying this is going to be Proust. This is my mind. And um, I'm... I really wanted to tell you this. So I'm going to start here and I'm going to tell you about writing and we're going to go, but hopefully it'll be around. I'm not going to flip it around the way he used to, but um, there's an integrity to mind, okay? If you trust it. I don't know, but you can watch writing practice in action, hopefully, or yada, yada, yada in action, whatever it is. But I want to start here. Okay, I was in fifth grade and maybe this was the beginning of me questioning my life. I was at the bus stop. I remember that. It was a few blocks, not a few blocks, a few houses down. I was waiting for the bus stop, a few other people milling around and I had a thought. <laughs> But I remember this so clearly. Bra. B R A. Bra. That's ridiculous. It has to be bra. It has to be bra. Bra? Why didn't they add an R to it? This was in New York. Maybe, maybe you've realized that. Bra. Brar. No, brar sounds much better. Okay, forget it. I'm going to say brar from now on. And I must have been, but there was a whole world in that. Do you see that? I was, fifth, was did I say fifth grade? About fifth grade. And 
you know, exploring things, my mind, my body, my growing body. So bra, okay, bra. So we're gonna go from there to time. Now, Natalie, how could, when I write, do writing practice, I can go any place. So now I know a lot of people are concerned about time, including me. And I often fight time. What Katagiri used to say, like fighting tofu, it gets you nowhere. <laughs> but we're always trying to get here on time, da, 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 time. But okay, let's imagine this. There's a train. We're out there looking at the train. The caboose is at the end of the train. Yes, the caboose is past time. Middle maybe where the, the um, passengers are, present time. And what's the beginning? The engine, thank you, <laughs> is future. You know, we're wanting to zip along. Now, this is the tricky part. We stand outside the train of time and think we're separate from it. Past, present, future. But actually, what we need to do is step on the train. You can step on it wherever you want, but time exists in us. That's incredible to think about. Time exists in us. There's no time. This wall is not thinking, I. I'm tired of hanging, standing up. That wall is just a wall. But we're fighting time. But time exists in us. Now, why I'm saying that is because what we usually do is step outside and think it's outside. Life, we... We know the time, huh? past, present, future. Yeah, I understand that. But we think it's separate from us and we're watching it. But we're not watching it. We're actually, if we really slow down or really get connected, time is in us. Okay, now I was re listening to a talk and this is particularly why I'm bringing it up. I was listening to a talk about nuclear bombs and nuclear energy by a very, very intelligent man who I think he's with a group of doctors. I didn't get his name and I wouldn't give it to you anyway because you'd run home and look it up and then you'd forget about it. So he said, and it, it was exactly right how the human being is. He said that we think we can drop a bomb, you know, send a bomb. And for some reason, we don't think it's going to come back. That somebody is going to send it back to us. And he said, I don't know what it is, but that's how we think. And, you know, some of it we think that way because we think we're superior. But really, it's exactly what we do with time. We don't realize we are the bombs. We are those nuclear bombs. Does that make sense? And so when we feel like we're sending it out there, we, we think we're free of it. Or we can send a time bomb out there and not be part of it. There's no such thing. Okay, can you follow me? So let's all sit up now and let's take it one step backwards. Okay. And I was doing this, I taught my first human beings two weeks ago, not on Zoom, human beings. And we sat, okay, so taking that, start, feel your breath. 
But what we all say is, feel your breath like we're above it and we're going to look at our breath or feel our breath. But when you really understand breath, oxygen comes in and your blood takes it all over your body. So can you sit and step into the whole sitting? Does that make sense? Just sit. And instead of Natalie is watching her breath, I'm breathing. And breath is breathing me. See if you could feel it fully. It's okay if your mind wanders. That's the nature of mind. Writing does writing. Zazen does zazen. Breathing does breathing. So very simply, as Roshi Jones says to essence, is there anything new you experienced? You can raise your hand or just speak out. Yeah. Peace. Peace. Is peace separate from you? Let me hear two more people. Fullness. What? Fullness. Fullness. Life force. Life force. Good. I was, um, two weeks ago, we were doing, I was really trying to get them into sitting. And I got real, I got really carried away, but I can say it here. When I went the next step with the group, they, I thought, Matt, pull it in. But I can say it here, whether it, you know, what I experience and what And you'll see, what is it to be peaceful? We don't exist. Breath does breath. We don't exist. That's, when Roshi used to say that, it was like, huh? But it was interesting. So we're going to keep going. This might not be a great book. (laughs) (laughs) About four weeks ago, I taught um, all the English teachers I love North Dakota. I love all the weird places in America that no one goes to. They're my specialty. And a few years ago, I went and um, for a weekend and taught in North Dakota in January. It was, the cold was so cold. It was cold, cold. I, I came home so enlivened. So when I was asked to teach the English teachers, I I said yes, but it was planned a year ago, and I was still afraid to fly. So we did it on Zoom. So this is exactly why I love. I even planned. I don't usually plan things, but I planned what I was going to teach. I was very excited. Okay, so 
Noah will particularly like this. Um, they didn't send me a link. Hmm. So I wrote them at night, the night before. You know, I don't have the link. I looked all over, I can't find it. Oh yeah, they wrote back and they sent me a link. I thought they're not making a big deal. Usually they say, well, get in touch, you know, op um, open it 15 minutes ahead and we'll check everything out that every, nothing. I thought, okay. So 8 a.m., I press the link and they press the link. And I don't know how many teachers there were because I couldn't see any of them. They had one laptop. Isn't that fabulous? I loved it. It was just one little laptop. And the teachers were all way out there. I couldn't see anybody. There was a blackboard behind them. And I just loved it. It was so, and they didn't apologize or anything. That was it. They have a laptop. You want to do Zoom? Okay. And um, I couldn't even tell if they were getting what I was saying or had any idea because I couldn't see anybody. So I really let it rip. <laughs> I just really let it rip. And one of the things I was talking about the Blackfeet Indian, but behind the teachers, there was a blackboard. So I said, you're the blackboard people. And I thought it was hysterical, but <laughs> I realized I couldn't tell if they thought it was funny or not. I couldn't tell anything. And all I could tell, there was a feeling that they were having a lovely time with each other. I had no idea. I mean, it was how far, like to the kitchen it was, you know, like, <laughs> and it was wonderful. It just let me rip. So one of the things that I wanted to do with them, I thought, um, you know, I, I wrote this book and I think it came out in 2008, Old Friend from Far Away. I don't want to do this anymore. I've done it. But I thought, you know, these are the English teachers and this would be so appropriate. Come on, Nat you know, be a good sport and share with this with them. And I didn't know if they liked it or not, or, but I saw something new. This is what I want to get across. I've probably done this, read this part a hundred times in different ways. And then I finally put it in there and I let it sleep I, or let it go out to the world. But I thought, you know, the English teachers, they would appreciate it. Did they? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But, <laughs> but it's by Jimmy Santiago Baca, who's a homeboy. He's from Albuquerque. He's a poet. He's been in jail and he taught himself to read and write. Well, I'm not going to tell you that. But anyway, he's great. And I think he's coming for, you know, um, Roshi and Kaz and I every year this must be the 15th year I, I don't know we don't know anymore they don't want to count is that we do haiku in February and one of the people that is coming is Jimmy Santiago Baca who knows if he writes haiku he'll just come but anyway I read this and because I was having so much fun and because, and this is what I want to get across, Zen is not just breathing or writing, but it's repetition. So how fantastic. I've done this so many times, but this time I saw something that I never saw before. So I'm going to read it to you and of course, enjoy it and you will. But see if this is why well, I'm a terrible, not a terrible teacher. I'm a tough teacher. I always ask the students, tell me what I found. Okay. Which is totally unfair, but who cares? <laughs> There's no such thing as fairness. Okay. So this is from Jimmy. Okay. Two years passed. I was 20 now. 
and behind bars again. The federal marshals had failed to provide convincing evidence to extradite me to Arizona on a drug charge, but still I was being held. They had 90 days to prove I was guilty. The only evidence against me was that my girlfriend had been at the scene of the crime with my driver's license in her purse. They had to come up with something else, but there was nothing else. Eventually, they negotiated a deal with the actual drug dealer who took the stand against me. When the judge hit me with a million dollar bail, I emptied my pockets on his booking desk, 26 cents. One night in my third month in the county jail, I was mopping the floor in front of the booking desk. Some detectives had kneed an old drunk and handcuffed him to the booking bars. His shrill screams racked my nerves like a hacksaw on bone. The desperate protest of his dignity against their inhumanity. But the detectives just laughed as he tried to rise and kicked him to his knees. When they went to the bathroom to pee and the desk attendant walked to the file cabinet to pull the arrest record, I shot my arm through the bars, grabbed one of the attendant's university textbooks and tucked it in my overalls. It was the only way I had of protesting. It was late when I returned to my cell. Under my blanket, I switched on a pen flashlight and opened the thick book at random, scanning the pages. I could hear the jailer making his rounds on the other tiers, the jangle of his keys and the sharp click of his boot heels intensified my solitude. Slowly, I enunciated the words, pond, ripple. Where did I leave off? Uh, it scared me that I had been reduced to this to find comfort. I always had thought reading a waste of time, that nothing could be gained by it, only by action, by moving out into the world and confronting and challenging the obstacles, could one learn anything worth knowing. Even as I tried to convince myself that I was merely curious, I became so absorbed and how the sounds created music in me and happiness, I forgot where I was. Memories began to quiver in me, glowing with a strange but familiar intimacy in which I found refuge. For a while, a deep sadness overcame me as if I had chanced on a long lost friend and mourn the years of separation. But soon the heartache of having missed so much of life that had numbed me since I was a child gave way as if a grave illness lifted itself from me and I was cured, innocently believing in the beauty of life again. I stumblingly repeated the author's name as I fell asleep, saying it over and over in the dark, words worth, words worth. Before long, my sister came to visit me and I joked about taking her to a place called Kubla Khan and getting her a blind date with this Vato named Coleridge who lived on the seacoast and was high on morphine. When I asked her to make a trip into enemy territory to buy me a grammar book, she said she couldn't. Bookstores intimidated her because she too could neither read nor write. 
Days later, with a stub pencil, I whittled sharp with my teeth. I propped a red chief notebook on my knees and wrote my first words. From that moment, a hunger for poetry possessed me. I have to say that, um, that when I was in uh, the Lake District in England, I went to Wordsworth Grave late at night and prostrated myself. I didn't really like him that much in English lit, but suddenly I saw his value. I prostrated myself three times and I told him about Jimmy Santiago Baca and the story. So what did, of course it's, it's terrific, pond, if you ever taught writing, ripple. But what was the new thing? And this is what I want to get. You keep showing up. The same, oh, this is so boring, but you keep doing it. I, and I thank the North Dakota English teachers because for them, I did it again. And I discovered something totally new. Yes, Noah? Was it word, like the double entendre of Wordsworth, the name? No, that was pretty fabulous, but that's all obvious. A writerly thing. It's not fair. I do this all the time with students. Does anyone have any idea? No, no, you're just doing recall now, which is excellent. And it's specific. Do you notice how specific? He doesn't get into any heaven and the truth stays but what i noticed this time that really pro maybe this will give you a hint that really propels it i can't believe i couldn't believe it i was so high i don't know if the teachers but i had such freedom maybe we should try that no i'll bring in my um what is it laptop okay propels the energy is carried by the verbs and his verbs. The first paragraph, he was warming up and the verbs are all to be, which are okay verbs. It's not a bad thing to be. You know, I'll give you an example. I was 20 now. I was being held. I was guilty. And then once he sinks in, it's totally mopping, need, handcuff, rack my nerves, grabbed, shot my arm, tucked it, switched. And I'm just reading a few of them. Jangle of his keys intensified my solitude. Do you get that? Enunciated the words, scared me, moving out, reduced, confronting challenging, absorbed, quiver, glowing, lifted, stumblingly repeated the author's name as I fell asleep. But the verbs are totally dynamic, totally alive. And I bet Jimmy wasn't even aware of it. Not because he's not aware of writing, but once you're propelled it carries you. Do you see that? I was so excited. And I thought, how did I not see this before? I knew it was alive. But it was the verbs. North Dakota. <laughs> Okay, so now we're going to turn as though I actually know what I'm doing. We're going to, I know that we're in a Zendo. We're going to turn to Dogen because Dogen, I want to tell you, if he's nothing else, he's a writer. And yes, AAG Monastery is beautiful, but how many of us will go to Japan? 
It's the writing that carried his life. Okay, so I just want to, um, I'm going to talk about him from a different angle than, um, and this is really the angle as a young, as a young girl, when I was practicing in Minnesota, Dogen, what is, who is this person and what is he talking about? But at the same time, I was a poet and I, his writing is hot. So I'm going to tell you just a little about Dogen in case you don't know. But we didn't know any of this. Katagiri might have told us, but we, we just had, it was so far. And, um, uh, and this part, though, I remember. But I remember it at nine years old. But during the Dogen weekend that we had here about a month ago, and it was terrific. Thank you, Roshi, for organizing that. I mean, it was terrific. And if it happens again, just come. You're not a Buddhist, who cares? Just come. It was so good. It was so hot. And um, so Dogen is really a writer. And that's how I followed him. So when he his father died when he was very young, I think he was about two. And then I had heard that he, his mother died when he was nine, but during the Dogen retreat, they said seven, so I, either way. Um, and at the funeral for his mother at nine, it has to be nine for me because I've always felt it. He watched the incense, you know, there were probably ceremonies. And as a young nine-year-old, he watched the incense, the smoke. And you know how it does this? The smoke from the incense. And with that, he realized impermanence, which is pretty fantastic. Because, you know, usually you're just wailing about your mother and the loss of your mother. But he not only realized that, and I'm sure he was heartbroken. And actually, because he was heartbroken, he could realize something else. So he realized impermanence. And then when I think he was 12, he went into a monastery. And I was very moved by being his nine-year-old self. And he went into a monastery and you have to understand, in Japan at the time, they looked to uh, China, even though they wouldn't admit it, you know, that um, Zen was really happening in China. And there was a lot of practice there. So he was with his teacher and, and together in a monastery. I have his, the teacher's name and stuff, but we're not going to. And um, together... When he was, uh, I think, 22, is that correct? Around then, his early 20s, he and his teacher did a journey to China looking for a good teacher, maybe to tell, to learn, like, what is this? What are we aching for? And they were there for two years, and Dogen was going to, he couldn't find anything, and he was going to give up. And just then he met his teacher. And just then his other teacher died in China. Okay. So he met his real teacher. And it's an extraordinary thing to have a teacher. And this begins in public school. First grade, you have a teacher taught you reading. So he found his teacher. And um, he had an experience of dropping body. What is it? Dropping body and mind. Is that it? Is that the expression? I don't even think we had that expression in the mid 70s in Minnesota. Okay. So dropping body and mind. What does that mean? Well, this is what's so important. And this is why I love Dogen. He, many of us 
whether we know it or not, have had experiences like that. But then we, it's like, what was that? Let's go get a hamburger. I've had enough. Let's get out of here as quick as we can. But we had, we've had openings. Maybe my opening was bra. But then I immediately know that's ridiculous. B-R-A. Why didn't they add an R? Okay. So, but it was complete. He just dropped off body and mind. You can't drop off body and mind forever, but you taste it. You experience it. He didn't forget it. And from then on, he came back and he continued. He established a monastery in Kyoto. The first one, I have, I'm not even going to name things because I, I don't remember the name. But what wasn't said in the Dogen retreat, Dogen was standing up under a lot of pressure. Just he came back and was trying in language to relate his experience. And he couldn't do it. I see the car, you know, subject for, well, in Japanese, I don't have that anyway. But even tr in translation, you can't just explain it. Because if you explain, and that's what drives me crazy now, the Zen books explain Zen, a bunch of the modern books, but you don't get any, it doesn't explain anything because you have to experience it. So Dogen came back, he established a monastery in Kyoto, but he was relentless because there were a lot of political problems then, and he knew he had to get out of there. So he went north and where it was very, at the time where he established AAG, there was nothing there. And it was very cold for Japan, very cold. They should taste North Dakota, <laughs> but um, it was very cold for Japan and very distant. So he was relentless. He didn't think, well, I established here. I'm not moving. I'm not budging. He noticed... He wanted to keep that dharma and that understanding, so he went someplace else. Okay, now this is very important. If we didn't have his writing, and some of it he earnestly tries to establish a whole monastery. He tells you how to cook. He tells you all of that, and it, it kind of makes sense, but... Um, Now, this, the problem is that this stuff has been thrown around a lot. So you think you know it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you don't know it, and I don't know it. And when, we, in, when I was in the mid-70s, it was like, what are they talking about? But I was very interested. And I was a... We were running over? Oh, I am... So what? Time is in us. I won't, I won't run over too long. Okay. But listen to this. This is ordinary. Slipping out of your old skin, not held back by past views. We take that for granted. You manifest immediately what has been dormant for boundless eons. Really? As this very moment manifests, I don't know. Who doesn't know? You have no expectations. And the Buddha eye sees beyond seeing. This experience is beyond the realm of human thinking. Nothing is beyond the realm of human thinking, you know, is how we were brought up, correct? I mean, I'll just read you just a little bit more, but then I'm going to show you something. For the time, oh, it's about time being.
but he's trying what he's really doing he had an experience of dropping off mind and body and he's trying in every way in language to have you experience it because he it doesn't he doesn't explain it does that make sense? He's not explaining. For the time being, here means time itself is being, and all being is time. I love that. Even though you do not measure the hours of the day as long or short, far or near, you still call it 12 hours because the signs of times coming and going are obvious, people do not doubt it. Although they do not doubt it, they do not understand it. What do you mean I have a watch? Mm -hmm. Or when sentient beings doubt what they do not understand, their doubt is not firmly fixed. Because of that, their past doubts do not necessarily coincide with the present doubt. Yet doubt is self is nothing but time. I love him. I love him because he's a writer trying in his way and in language to give you his experience. And he can't give it, well, you know what it's like to eat a really good strawberry. That's what it was like. No, that wouldn't make it. And that would be assimilate this to this. Does this make sense? You know, with all his life, and he, on, he only lived till 53. Now, in some civilizations, that's pretty good. But there were people living a lot longer. He was young, and he gave every ounce. Now, being a young poet, no, I'm just going to go a little bit more because I have to. Being a young poet, the other half of me was trying to learn poetry in the world and leaving the zendo and here and so i was studying here is a poem by a neurodivergent group we used to call it excuse me it was poems from the writing workshop at norhaven a residence for women who are mentally retarded but they clearly that's not the right word but that this was in 1975. This was a collaboration of neurodivergent people and a memory to Leia Lind. And I bet Dogen could relate to it because they don't have strict idea about how to use language to get the experience over. Do you understand? And in a way, Dogen was neurodivergent. He was trying to tell you here how his experience here, how to do that. Okay, so here. And it's a memory to Leia Lind. I would take Leia up to the clouds. You feel like a new person, like your own self after you die. I would show her pink fire and dresses and pink roses, two bouquets in a land of pink. The two souls will ride on the souls of horses and sing. Leia liked to sing. And going to a bowling alley on the clouds makes lightning, makes like thunder. She's invisible. She goes through the rain without getting wet. So I think Dogen is in some way, though he's very, he knows what he's doing. He's also trying to give us an experience of something that we never had an experience of. And it's better than reading a lot of books about Zen to go directly to Zen. Like Basho, the great haiku writer said, if you want to know a tree, go to the tree. If you want to know Dogen, or if you want to know Zen, re go to the sources. And it's okay if you don't understand it. It's better to not understand it. 
than to understand it or think you understand it. I, now, I don't know if I gave you the mind of writing right there, but for me, it makes sense. <laughs> Sorry, Noah. I'll quit now. But, you know, I remember many years ago, we did a Dogen for a weekend, and it was the beginning of Upaya, and I compared Faulkner and Dogen. Because they're not the same, and Faulkner was nuts. Maybe Dogen at the end became a little crazy, too, but we won't go into that. Okay. Um, but uh, Faulkner, at the same time, had a vision that we couldn't get. France got it, South America got him, but we didn't get him. We hated him, wrote mean critiques about his writing. Okay, I'll shut up now. Are we doing something now? <laughs> <laughs> Could you turn this? Skyla. Oh. Natalie, thank you so much sure. for that journey <laughs> through the mind writing. And uh, the last piece that you said, that was the mind of writing. Um, did you say it one more time? That is the mind of writing. <laughs> And I, I also remember, I memorized. Turn, turn it back uh, on. How do you do that? I memorized a short poem where Dogen makes sense. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, makes logical sense. So I'm going to tell it to you. And it was um, translated by Robert Bly, who is a great poet. Um, These drifting clouds are pitiable. What sleepwalkers men become. Awakened, I hear the one true thing. Black rain on the roof of Fukukusu Temple. <laughs> so don't be good. Don't think that Dogen, you can't make comments about Dogen can stretch. He's, he's strong enough. 
Thank you, Natalie. And we'll definitely have a Dogen seminar next year and join us oh, for goodness. Haiku in February. And um, uh, please, please support Natalie and her work in the world uh, through your donations. I'll be holding the begging bowl. If you don't have cash, there are QR codes on the board outside. So feel free. And uh, we're just off for a bow. And if you'd like to join for dinner, we have some uh, some extra food. So please join us if you like. You can come around in the kitchen. Thanks so much, everyone.